Life is made up of experiences. Experiences shape our perspectives and allow us to pass along knowledge. In this podcast, I sit down with listeners like you and find out that no matter who you are, everyone has a story to tell. I'm Ethan Smith, and this is Life Experienced. No matter where you live, weather conditions have the potential to impact your day-to-day life. No one knows this better than Kevin Myatt, who has been reporting on current and historical weather events for years. Kevin's fascination with weather events began at a young age when he had aspirations of becoming a meteorologist. When you said you wanted to be a meteorologist, was it something you wanted to do from a kid, or did that come along later? Um, Well, it's hard always to point to an exact point, but very early in my life as a child, uh, an event I point to a lot of times as kind of the early genesis of this was uh, in March of 1976. We had a uh, pretty serious tornado outbreak in Arkansas. We had a lot of tornadoes in Arkansas growing up, a lot of tornado sirens and you know, running uh, for cellars and things like that. That was that was kind of the early weather kind of uh, phenomenon that um, stirred my interest. But uh, this particular outbreak, uh, there was actually a tornado visible on the western horizon from uh, our home. And my mother literally picked me up and held me and held me out the back window, back uh, kind of a sliding glass uh, patio door, really, to uh, to get a look at this tornado. And, of course, that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take cover. But <laughs> of course, it, it was yeah. moving a different direction. It wasn't moving at us. Yeah. So, uh, and it was, you know, 10 miles away. But um, uh, from an early age, that and the fact that the late, mid and late 70s winters were uh, pretty pretty severe, even as far south as, as where I was living, um, really stoked my interest in weather. And it, I was the weather guy in school, you know, the, the one the kids ask about whether it was going to snow or not, mm-hmm. we're going to be out of school tomorrow. And that's really what I'm still doing uh, okay. <laughs> all these years later is people, like, or we're going we're gonna to be out of school tomorrow. So uh, uh, I don't ever give them a straight answer. I just say, well, here's the forecast. But um, uh, that's the early genesis mm-hmm. of, of wanting to be a meteorologist. Kevin would place his meteorology dream on hold when he discovered his affinity for writing. He began working jobs at a local newspaper and went on to complete a journalism degree at Arkansas State University. I actually worked at the hometown newspaper during the course of my college. So, you know, I I actually start my first day at the newspaper was before my first day of college. Um, But the first thing I did was was sports. Mm -hmm. I I covered sports for uh, seven years at Jonesboro Sun, mostly high school, local high school coverage, doing the copy desk kind of stuff, you know, editing copy and writing headlines and making sure the paper gets out on time. But uh, also um, a pretty significant beat with the the biggest high school in the area and a little bit of college sports along the way, too. You know, the local university, Arkansas State, we're kind of a -a rent-a-win team for Virginia Tech sometimes, for instance. Um, But... uh, you know, just getting to do some secondary stories like that uh, for our main beat writer on, on college sports. So my first seven years were sports, and that te- what sports writing teaches you, you learn to experience is the, the deadlines are, are very strict. You come in from late games, you have very short time to write them, and you've got to crunch a lot of numbers in a hurry. So I think um, I think those early days, and they were also just a lot of fun to cover. Cover, you know, I saw Peyton Manning when he was a freshman playing at the University of, against the University of Arkansas and things like that. Uh, um, so I think it was just a very a very good time for me. Then uh, I took I had a year covering general news, politics, education, et cetera, and after that I became the man, assistant editor at a smaller paper in Batesville, Arkansas, about 50 miles west, and I eventually became the managing editor there. And uh, that was only about a three-year period, but that was also a a key learning period, and that kind of got me ready for the bigger move out east. In 1999, Kevin interviewed for a copy editor position at the Roanoke Times in Roanoke, Virginia, and he got the job. Almost 20 years later, Kevin continues to edit and proof articles for the paper, But in the early 2000s, he had an opportunity to return to writing about a subject he loves. I was, uh, I don't think, I I was late 90s, I'm weighing what I want to do. And um, 
the editing job opens and, and then eventually I end up here in Roanoke uh, at the Roanoke Times as a copy editor. And even then I didn't have like this set idea of what I wanted to do. And the weather thing was on the back burner. Yeah. But it, it came back for me. So so when when did that come back? We can just talk about that. Um, along the way, during the course of my newspaper career, and mostly in Arkansas, I had covered weather stories. I, there's kind of a running thing in journalism that news reporters don't want to do weather stories. They find them boring or they find <laughs> them... Uh, you know, they don't a lot of a lot of times news frankly, news reporters don't have the background of knowledge in weather and, and they're, they're kinda like stories they avoid. That's mm-hmm. always kind of a big you 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 put them down on like the lowest uh, on the on the totem pole cops reporter or uh we used to have editorial assistants and uh they get the weather stories. But I always volunteered for the weather stories because okay. I, I went kind of more in depth with them and of course we had the tornadoes and the some snow and stuff to cover. But when I came here it got to a point where I was advising through email the edit the uh, editors at the paper that hey we got this weather system coming in this might be a big story we should cover it and uh, eventually uh, Mike Riley who was the editor of the paper time got the idea that hey you could write about this online and so I wrote a little thing online that nobody ever read nobody knew it was there <laughs> but then we we had a redesign of the paper in two thousand three and they needed some new content for a new uh, page inside. Virginia section called Town Square, and and they just said, well, you know, you're already writing this. Why don't you we write it twice a week, and put it on Town Square? So that's the genesis of what is called Weather Journal. Blog started three years later, and um, there were a lot of people that weren't giving it long odds of surviving. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody's going to be interested in this. This is nobody wants to hear. You know, see you write about weather, but um, 16 years later, it's still here and has a pretty good following. So I'm very thankful for that. Reporting on the weather has also provided Kevin with some unique and exciting opportunities. Among these are several weather-related outings with the Virginia Tech Meteorology Program that I couldn't help but notice in his bio on Roanoke.com. I'll let him describe these trips. So I did notice that your bio on the Roanoke Times page says that you've led students on storm-chasing outings. So... Obviously, that would that there's something there's a story there behind that, or it wouldn't be there. So, why don't you talk to me about that? Um, you know, I've done a little bit of individual kind of storm tracking, storm mm-hmm. you know, storm chasing, even into the '90s when I lived in Arkansas and, and saw tornadoes at fairly close range. Uh, when the weather blog started going, um, I got interest from the weather service here, and they invited me for a tour, and they told me about a teacher who was then at. Pulaski uh, County High School is now a professor at Tech named Dave Carroll, who led storm chases to the plains. So I contacted him and, you know, was just wanting to do a story about it. And he's like, hey, do you want to go? And this was 2004, but I, I couldn't go right that year. But I did the next year in 2005. And so every year from 2005 to 2017 or 2016, skipping 17 and then last year, 18, um, I have been on a uh, helping lead a Virginia Tech meteorology storm chase. Um, mostly college meteorology students. Uh, it's all college meteor- meteorology students. Now it used to be some high school students mixed in. But um, uh, that's how it got started. And, and I've been on one ever since. And, you know, in that time, we've seen some pretty incredible stuff. We've been a little too close a few times. Uh, you know, we've had some big hail and some, you know, tornado cross the running quarter, quarter mile in front of us and things like that. Um, Maybe not quarter mile, might have been more like a half to a mile, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure know, it felt like it was. There was a there, there was a case, a tornado cross road a quarter mile in front of me when I was when I was in Arkansas. So I'm probably getting those mixed up. But in any event, um, it's been it's been a very interesting thing. Of course, people get with all things they get a, a kind of a wrong perception of storm chasing from Twister and and that reality show Storm Chasers that was on a few years because they don't show the boring parts. Mm. You know, there's a lot of driving around and there's a lot of hot sunny days that there's nothing happening and you got to go somewhere to uh, you know find something to do. But uh, you know, throw the frisbee in the mm-hmm. in the something around. But uh, um, when the when it, it does get pretty intense when we're around the big storms and uh, I've been very blessed to be able to see some uh, remarkable stuff in that time. Wow, that sounds interesting. 
<laughs> I, yeah, I, I suppose my perception of storm chasing has also been influenced <laughs> by those television shows. So, of course, there's a very real, you know, right now the the Weather Channel was sued just a few days ago for I, I can't remember the amount, a hundred plus million dollars, um, over a uh, a case where a couple of people they hired uh, ran uh, ran a stop sign and ran into another storm chaser and. The per, you know all three of them the two people in the weather channel vehicle and the one uh in the other vehicle died wow so the family of the one is suing because it was the weather channel vehicle that mm-hmm. reportedly rode, ran the stop sign uh, and of course a few years ago we had tim samaras the famous storm chaser and, and two of his um uh including his son and an, another uh companion another uh, uh a colleague of his that uh that died in in a tornado in uh, oklahoma a really large tornado so there is that you know there is that factor there is the danger factor of course as we always say uh we're not trying to do what some of them are doing putting probes in front of it and stuff mm-hmm. uh we want to be uh parti- we want to be observers and not participants you know right. we want to be able to see the storms but not be in the middle of them and um also it's just the fact that on the list of dangers the tornado is way down the list the first and foremost danger of a storm chase trip is the same danger if you're taking a band trip to you know your band taking your college band to a competition or taking your math students to a competition or something like that. And that's, that's, that's highway travel. That is mm-hmm. all our biggest near misses have not been near storms. They've been uh, uh, a, a piece of metal flying off of a, a diesel truck and, and almost crashing on us and things like that. Right. So that's still the biggest danger. So what, what is, uh, you mentioned there's a lot of, of waiting around. And so what happens when, there is actually something that you go out and do and look at. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the whole purpose of the trip is, is to teach the students forecasting and to get them, um, to actually see and feel and smell even the, the storms in their real environment, not just blips on a radar. So the whole purpose is for the students to look at the forecast models day by day and get us in a position where we think that we will be able to see storms go up and then go after those storms. So ideally we are already kind of close when they go up. We're not, if we're, if we're too far away, it's not going to matter. We're not going to get there anyway, but there is, there is a certain amount of adrenaline that starts pumping when you know that, Hey, this, this is real today. And especially when you start seeing those cumulus towers go up and they get dark and the, the anvil goes out and spreads out and, and, and you see on radar, there's rotation in it and, and you're driving towards it. You know, there is just, it, it there is, there is that adrenaline that, you, that, that starts to kick in. And, um, you know, our main thing is we got to keep our students focused on keeping their eyeballs open in all directions. Uh, keep your head on the swivel. We like to say, uh, keeping focused on the radar, uh, and, and on our path because we want to be able to get in a position where we can observe these storms and then have a way out mm-hmm. uh, when if they start moving a different direction or even just if they move closer to us because uh, you know we we have a perfect safety record on our uh, Virginia Tech storm chases and we'd like to keep it that way when he's not chasing storms or blogging about the weather Kevin is still a copy editor at the newspaper And the success of newspapers, unfortunately, is not something that you read about in the news much these days. More on that right after this. Over the past few months, my wife and I have been able to save some time and money and develop a whole new set of cooking skills. How did we do it? We started subscribing to Every Plate. Every Plate is a meal kit delivery service that's different from others you may have heard of because it only costs $5 per serving, which is about half as much as those other meal kits cost. Each meal features a recipe that's made from fresh ingredients and only takes about 30 minutes to make. The box of ingredients and recipe cards are delivered to your door each week, so all that's left for you to do is enjoy making the meals. If you'd also like to sharpen your cooking skills and enjoy recipes you want to make over and over, you can get $20 off your first box from EveryPlate by visiting lifeexperienced.org slash everyplate. That's lifeexperienced.org slash everyplate for $20 off your first delivery. Welcome back. The information age has brought with it many resources that offer 24-7 access to news, thoughts, and photos across the World Wide Web. 
Unfortunately for newspaper companies, this has resulted in a massive decrease in readership over the past decade. Since Kevin has been working at newspapers for his entire career, I asked him to share his thoughts about this decline. You've been in the newspaper business for a long time, and, and so it's kind of something that is on the downtrend overall. And so if, if you do, if you can, or if you can remember, if you, can, if you want to discuss kind of what that has looked like for you during your career journey... That would be great. I would I would be interested to know. Well, there's no doubt that there's a lot of factors, and it's not one thing that's impacting uh, journalism, uh, newspaper journalism. Uh, Technology is a factor. Um, one of the big things is uh, the like the things like Amazon are 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 hitting big box stores and big box stores like the you know the Sears and the Kmart's and belk and things like that in the past have been the ones that have uh, have uh, kept newspapers going through us uh, you know buying large large ads circulars things like that so um there are many factors that are, are shrinking newspaper uh, subscriptions i think also just demographics that older people read newspapers and younger people go online and so we've had to have a the, the one big change is, is just how much of an online presence uh I was at one of the papers in Arkansas. I was there as they were starting their online site. So I was kind of on the ground floor of that. And then I came here to Virginia and, and, and worked working at Roanoke and, and got involved pretty early in having a lot of my stuff online. So um, I've been kind of in the middle of, of this transition where you're in both worlds still. One foot's still in the print, one foot's uh, online. Um, but, you know, what I'm noticing around me is just fewer people. I mean, uh, you know, the Roanoke Times used to be just kind of every floor. There used to be people in every corner, you know, it seemed like. And now there are large parts of it. There's, there's nobody there. And that's you, – you need fewer people now. And we're also part of a chain and share some some uh, processes with other newspapers, mainly Lynchburg. And um, it, you just need fewer people. And it's very sad when colleagues – uh are laid off. I mean, we've had that happen a couple of times with, uh, with, uh, job reductions and there is no guarantee for any of us that, uh, we'll, we'll be there next week. I mean, you know, it's a very real thing and, and you have to plan a little bit for that. You can't plan totally for it cause you're not going to know until it happens. But, uh, um, and, and the fact that my wife also works in the newspaper, she's, she's on the copy desk with me is where I met her. Um, um, so, uh, it, it does cast a little bit of uncertainty on, on, on everybody in the journalism business right now is, is kind of feeling this uncertainty of, of when the next shoe drops and, and will I, and I, I think my online presence with the weather has given me a little longevity maybe that I wouldn't have had if I'd just been doing the copy desk stuff. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, you know, like I say, you just don't know week to week, year to year, what, what's there for you. Do you think there's anything that just if you had a platform to say it that people could do to support to support the work that you're doing and the work around the, of the few people that are left in, in newspapers? Well, it's just um, all of us are resistant to paying for things. You know, I, I, I'm the I'm the worst at this. I mean, I'll, I'll call up an article on Twitter or Facebook and, and then I hit a paywall. I'm not paying for that. And after a while, I, you know, you realize that. If I don't pay for what they're doing, whatever it may be, the Washington Post or New York Times or, or some local paper back home or something, that um, they're not going to be able to pay their people who provide this work. And it's the same thing. It's just in, invest in local uh, local newspapers. I mean, um, the big newspapers are fine for, for covering Washington, D.C. and the stock market and, and whatever's happening in Hollywood. But, but you're not going to find out um, that your, uh, your neighbor's house is being condemned and they're going to put a highway through there, uh, unless you pay attention to your local, your local boards and your local supervisors. And, and, and only, only the local newspaper is covering that kind of thing, your local reporters. So just, um, um, you know, invest in, in, in local journalism, get a subscription to the paper, but at least buy an online subscription. They're usually cheaper. I mean, um, and, uh, Keep up with your local news, and and someday we're going to have a. We were in some parts of the country, we've already got a, pretty much a crisis that local boards are not being covered, and they can get away with anything if if you don't shine the light 
upon them. I mean, it's just human nature and the nature of politics and uh, such. So it's nothing necessarily bad about people serving on boards or anything. It's just things happen when there's not light shining on them. So that, that would be the only thing I would say is just, uh, I, I appreciate every single person who buys us. I appreciate the people who subscribe. People have told me they subscribe mainly because I'm still in there, you know, and I appreciate that, but also appreciate when they, they, they want to support my colleagues who are covering uh, school boards and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, sports events and, um, et cetera, et cetera. Kevin definitely enjoys his position at the paper as an editor and weather blogger, so I hope he's there for many years to come. However, if the time comes for him to step out into something new, he'll be able to reflect on his past experiences for guidance. I would just say that uh, anytime you move to a new area, you're never sure quite what you're going to experience or, or be like. And uh, I came, I came to Roanoke in 1999 and I was, uh, my, my thought process was this could last six months. I could be going back to Arkansas or, you know, or, or go somewhere else. So I'm going to make the most of it, but uh, I've been here nearly 20 years now. And, uh, in Southwest Virginia, Roanoke, Blacksburg, Virginia tech have all, uh, 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 become very near and dear to my heart. And, um, um, all I would say is just, uh, uh, I've really enjoyed my time here, and uh, you you never know day to day. I, I I have young kids. I expect maybe we will they will grow up in this area. You never know day to day what can happen with different various things. But um, um, I always encourage people when I'm talking with students. Uh, I do a lot of talking to college students and stuff. To um, the online age, social media age is is both very positive and very negative, as we know, and. Um, it's very important to find your niche. There is somebody that is interested in what you're interested in. And to find that niche, I think you're probably doing it here, you know, you're or at least trying to do it, or, or you know, with, with your podcast, is that if you're interested in it, somebody else is interested in it. And uh, it's very important if you're, if you're trying to build a, a career or build um, a reputation to find your niche and throw yourself into that and see what happens. I mean, I had no idea that uh, the stuff, the kind of writing about weather that I do would be as well received and, and the way I approach it, which is maybe a little different than some people. And I have more time and than a weather caster with 10 minutes. Um, but uh, you know, just throw through, I, I said, throw your bread upon the waters. I think it's a, a old Testament expression, but uh, go ahead and do that. You know, encourage anybody to do that to see, if you, if you, if you've got an idea, if you've got something that you think uh, you're interested in that others might be just, just uh, do a, do a blog, do a, do a, do a YouTube page, do, do something and just see, cause you might be amazed sometimes. Kevin's work at the newspaper, both the editing and reporting on weather will continue to serve the residents of the Roanoke and New River Valleys here in Virginia. I hope his story will inspire you to try something new and find your niche. You never know, it might just be chasing storms. Life Experienced is hosted and produced by Ethan D. Smith and is primarily distributed via Anchor.fm. The show is also available via DSound, a decentralized audio sharing platform built on the Steam blockchain. For more information, visit dsound.audio. The music in this podcast is composed by Lee Rosevere and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. For more information, visit freemusicarchive.org. If you like the show, be sure to share it with others. Links to learn more about this episode, as well as more information on the podcast itself, may be found by visiting lifeexperienced.org. And for those of you still listening, while Kevin mostly writes about forecast models and historical weather events, he does recall reporting on a few notable weather events in the Roanoke Valley during his time at the newspaper. Yeah, so what are your what are some of your memorable moments of, of covering the weather over the last t- almost 20 years? Um, the biggest, I still say the biggest event, um, maybe the landmark event was the derecho, the, uh, the, uh, derecho of, of June 30, uh, June 29, excuse me, of 2012, the big windstorm, the big 
Squall line, it came down. We, we had the 100-plus we degree day. It was 104 in Roanoke. It was 90-something in Blacksburg. We had the uh, big squall line come down and cause massive wind damage across the Ohio Valley into into much of Virginia with, you know, over a million people without power. And it was, you know, a, a ma- big mess. That, I think, um, uh, that storm is still what I think of as kind of the, maybe the the highlight moment, just because it was such an intense event and, and so much, uh, so much pain and suffering, frankly, because it stayed hot after the power. You know, a lot of people lost their power, and and, um, and being able to keep people abreast of that, including the fact that at ten thirty that morning on the blog, I mentioned that this was a possibility. We wasn't for sure, but I mean, even used the word derecho, which some people think is a made up word, or you know, it dates to the eighteen hundreds, so it's not, it's not, it's a, it dates longer than that in the Spanish language. But as far as a weather event, it dates to the eighteen hundreds. So uh, that was. That and um, about three big snowstorms. Uh, people, my number one um, withdrawal in terms of online hits is snow. People, anytime I mention snow, yeah. I, I get a lot of hits. And and we, you know, the big snowstorm of two thousand nine, and the one of twenty fourteen, and even the one just this past mm-hmm. December. Um, those kind of things really draw a lot of. It doesn't take it doesn't take a foot of snow though to to get people interested in snow. Even a two to four will do it. But uh, those are kind of some of the key events, I think. If you're interested in staying up to date on weather events in the Roanoke area, or you just want to know what on earth a derecho is, links to Kevin's blogs and social media accounts are available in the blog post for this episode on lifeexperience.org. Hi, everyone. Thank you again so much for listening. I wanted to take a moment to encourage you to find a way to support your local journalists. The best way, like Kevin said, is to find the nearest newspaper and get a print or digital subscription. But if you can't do that, Share your local newspaper's articles on social media. Find their websites, Facebook pages, and Twitter feeds, especially if you're interested in local government, education, or generally just what's happening in your town. You might just find someone like Kevin who's writing articles you'll love, and you'll definitely find more inspirational and encouraging stories than you'll ever see on major media outlets. I'm a proud Roanoke Times subscriber, so I hope you'll join me in supporting the folks who keep society accountable, share uplifting stories, and help us live better lives. Once again, I'm Ethan Smith, and until next time, get out there and experience life.